Great, thank you. Um, wonderful to be here. Thanks all for coming. And um, yeah, I guess welcome. This is a wonderful event you guys have. Uh, the Steam Week is fantastic. I've spoken to Steam Week in previous years. It's always been fun. So uh, I've always gotten really interesting questions. So as I speak, please think of questions to ask, and we can discuss them after I'm done with my, uh, with my presentation. Hopefully the presentation will not take the whole time. So let's see. So what I wanted to tell you a little bit about today is basically um, uh, you know, kind of a little bit about blockchains, how they work, what they're for, and so on. But before that, I figured I'll start with a little bit about, about me. So like, what do, I, what do I work on? How did I get to where I am? What does life as a Stanford professor look like? And so on, just very briefly. So what I work on, so I'm a computer scientist. I'm, a, I'm in the computer science department. I work on uh, basically cryptography and computer security. Both of these are like super, super fun areas. Very hot, everybody is interested in these topics these days. But uh, I kind of uh, focus on four different areas, just to give you a sense of, of, of the sort of things that we research. Um, so the first one is basically kind of core to computer security, which is basically how to build secure systems. So the funny, the interesting thing about building secure systems is you, you cannot learn how to build a secure system unless you also know how to attack systems. Yeah, so you learn to attack and you learn to defend at the same time. So uh, if basically what we do is we, um, we come, up, come up, sometimes we come up with interesting defense techniques, uh, we come up with interesting attack techniques, and we show how to, t how to fix the, 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 the problems that are identified. So it's kind of a, a fun sort of a loop that we go through, you know, break things, fix things, break things, fix things, and the goal is to, to make the, uh, the, the world basically overall much more secure. The other area I work on is cryptography. I don't know how many of you have heard of cryptography in the past, but cryptography is more generally what I would call the science of protecting information. It's, it has to do with encryption, it has to do with, well, data confidentiality, data integrity, um, things like this. The beautiful thing about cryptography is that it's, it's kind of a very applied area in the sense that you guys are using cryptography all day long, right? Every time you send a text message, every time you, well, maybe text message, no, every time you send a chat message, every time you connect to Google, every time you connect to Amazon, every time you use the web, you're basically using cryptography in one way or another to protect the information you're sending on the internet. So on the one hand, it's a very applied area that actually is used by the entire planet. And on the other hand, it's super mathematical. So for me, this is like, I always kind of enjoyed math, even as a kid your age, I really, I really uh, liked the ideas in, in math. And um, uh, for me, this was like the, the, the best of both worlds. I get to play with very deep mathematics, and yet everybody really cares about this. My test is, um, you know, if we're at a dinner party and somebody asks me what I work on, I say, oh, I work on cryptography. They also, they always want to learn more. They always, always want to hear more. So this is kind of a test that uh, this is an interesting area. In recent years, basically cryptography has found a new customer. Yeah, traditionally, the customer for cryptography was the internet, internet applications. In recent years, um, it turns out that there is this new field that just emerged basically back in 2009. It's called blockchains. We'll talk about that more. And Blockchains are now kind of a new customer, for a new consumer of cryptography. They deploy very, very advanced cryptographic techniques, as we'll see in just a minute. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to work in that space as well. And finally, uh, I also work on uh, what, what we call the security of machine learning algorithms. So I'm sure all of you have heard of machine learning, right? The, the um, amazing things that are happening with, with GPT-3 and DALI. I hope you guys actually got to play with, those, with these models. It's amazing things that um, machine learning is able to do. But uh, maybe surprisingly, maybe not too surprisingly, these algorithms are very brittle. For example, if you train a, a machine learning model to, to just differentiate between a stop sign and a yield sign, yeah, you get a model that works really, really well on real examples in the real world. But it turns out if you're a hacker, it's actually quite easy to take a stop sign, just add a few pixels to it, and all of a sudden, you have to put, place the pixels in the right place, and all of a sudden, the model thinks it's a yield sign. Yeah, so you can kind of fool models with adversar these are called adversarial examples. You can fool these models very easily. So what's surprising is that machine learning does amazing things, but it sort of barely works in the sense that an attacker can cause these things to, uh, to, to uh, greatly malfunction. And so the question is basically, how do we b uh, build robust models? How do we protect the training, the training system, training environment, and so on and so forth? So we work on that, on, on that as well. So those are kind of the four areas that we work on. Um, I guess they asked me to talk about my career path. My career path was very simple. So I started in high school, well, like you guys are right now. Um, I was always interested in, uh, in more of the STEM side of things, mathematics, physics, computer science, and so on. Um, from then, I, I became an undergrad. I went to, uh, did a computer science uh, major, um, as, you, as you might expect. 
when I graduated um, as a computer scientist, I actually, for me, I always wanted to do, I was much more excited about research than uh, kind of inventing new things than about um, working in industry. And so the path to get into research is basically to, get, to go get a PhD. So I went to Princeton to uh, get my PhD in computer science. And after I graduated from Princeton, I became a professor at Stanford. It was a lot of fun uh, to do this. The PhD was f a fantastic experience. You get to be the world expert on, um, on one topic. Uh, so you go very, very deep in a particular area. In my case, it was cryptography. Um, and you know, obviously, being a professor at Stanford is a lot of fun. You know, I get to invent new things. Uh, it's never boring. There's always new, new things to do. I get to teach smart students, and I have a blast actually doing it. So this is kind of the best job in the world. I don't think a lot of people understand how, um, you know, how fulfilling life as an academic is. So if this is something that's appealing to you, like being a researcher or being an academic, you know, uh, doing both research and teaching, this is basically the career path to, uh, you know, get a. Uh, bachelor's, get a, get a PhD, and then uh, go to university. Let's see. I couldn't actually bring myself to give this talk and not give you a little bit of advice, yeah? So I thought, what advice can I give, can I give high schoolers yeah, that would have helped me uh, when I was your age? And there are all sorts of platitudes that I could tell you about, but, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say platitudes. So the one thing that I'll tell you that I, I try to live my life by is... Um, you know, our world today is very different from the world a hundred and definitely a thousand years ago. Yeah, our world changes all the time. There's constantly new ideas coming up, constantly new areas being developed. You know, when you live in a fast-moving world, the worst thing you can do is stagnate, kind of stand in one place and never, ever move. Yeah, and so if you want to, so the way to get around that is basically to constantly be learning new things. So yeah, that's how you learn about new, new developments that are happening. That's how you learn about, uh, you know, maybe you know, maybe you should change your career to go to this new area that just popped out. And so my advice to you, which is actually how I try to live my life, is literally at the end of every day, I ask myself, well, what new things did I learn today? Yeah? And if, it t if my answer to that is I learned nothing new today, then I go, ha I sit down, I open Wikipedia, I open YouTube, I open some educational material, and I go, I go study something new. Yeah, so just try to do that. Just learn something new every day. You know, it'll keep you active. It'll keep you up to date. And uh, it's a, I think it's a good life goal to, uh, to, uh, to keep. So anyhow, that's my, my short advice. Lots of other platitudes I could give, but this is, uh, this is the one I chose. All right. So what I want to tell you about today is a little bit about, uh, about blockchains and how they work and what they're for. So, so let's get started. So first of all, the, the first question you might ask, actually, let's do a quick show of hands. So how many of you have heard of uh, blockchains? Almost everybody. Uh, oh, not everybody. Uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, maybe some of you are not paying attention. Uh, <laughs> uh, how many of you, let, let's just uh, so we can calibrate, let's see. How many of you have, or your, you or your parents actually have bought any, any, um, any blockchain assets, like cryptocurrencies or NFTs? Ah, okay. So a much, much uh, smaller number. Interesting. So basically, um, blockchains are much more broad than what you hear about in the, in the news. Yeah, in fact, if you, if you only learn about them through the news, uh, you get a very skewed vision uh, of what they actually are. So blockchain is basically a way for people to coordinate. That's fundamentally what they are, a way for people to coordinate when there is no single trusted party. In fact, if, you, if there is a trusted party, if you trust Google, if you trust the government, there is no need for you to use a blockchain. You can just centralize everything in a single database, and there's no need to use something more complicated. So these things are useful primarily when there's no single party that you want to trust. Now. Um, Whenever we talk about kind of a new technology, you know, again, in the press, people always talk about, you know, prices going up and prices are going down and scams and hacks. That's not what this is about. Whenever you hear about a new technology, the first question you should ask is, what does it let me do today that I couldn't do before? Yeah, what is the new idea here? What's, what's new about this technology? What's different now that we didn't have before? And the answer is uh, the following. So, these, th these ideas came out, were deployed back in 2009 in a network that's well known now called Bitcoin. What Bitcoin gave us is something that we simply didn't have before, and it's not what you think. What it gave us is what I call a, a public append-only data structure. Yeah, so it's something that we didn't have before. So what is a public append-only data structure? What it is, is basically data, a data structure, it's a piece of data that lives uh, on computers in such a way that anyone can write to it and you are guaranteed that anything you write to it will stay in this data structure and will never be removed. Yeah, so things that we write to the blockchain today 
will stay on the blockchain a hundred and hopefully even a thousand years from now. That they can never, ever, ever be removed. And that's something that we simply didn't have before, right? If you think about this for a second, you ask yourself, well, how is this possible? Right, we know that if I write something to a computer, I can always just reinstall the operating system. I can kind of reset the computer and destroy what, uh, what was written to the computer you know, 10 minutes ago. So how is it that we are able to store on a computer something that's, that's, that's there and can never be removed? So let's see, so does anybody know the answer? How, do, how, do you, how would you, if you had to build a system that lets you store things in such a way that they can never be removed, what would you do? Like, there's one answer, there's one word, the answer is one word. How would you prevent data from being destroyed? Uh, any, feel free to shout it out, yeah. Keeping it what? Keeping it all, well, but even if it's on all the time, you know, computers, A, computers can crash, and B, computers could actually uh, be uh, reverted, right? You could actually delete information on a computer. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Exactly, you got it, that's exactly, that's exactly right. So the way we keep information and preventing it from being deleted is we replicate it all over the planet, right? We replicate it thousands and thousands of times, and that guarantees that even if one copy gets, gets messed up, there are lots of other copies that will keep the data around. Okay, so this is kind of the idea. By, and by the way, once you start replicating information, you get into consistency problems. How do we know that the replicas are all consistent with one another? Right, maybe one replica says one thing and another replica says another thing, and that would be, that would be uh, problematic. So for example, if I pay you $5, right, and I record the fact that I paid you $5 on this data structure, we wanna make sure nobody can remove that fact, right, because otherwise it would be like, I never paid you. And when we replicate it all, all over the planet, we wanna make sure that all the replicas say that I paid you $5. If some replica says, if some replicas say that I paid you and some replica say, says, say, that I didn't pay you, then we don't know whether the tra transfer happened or not. Okay, and so once you start lay, uh, putting down these requirements, you very quickly end up with an architecture of a blockchain, and that's actually where this comes from. Okay, so we have a new capability now, an append-only data structure, though anyone can write to it, and once you write to it, the data can never be removed. This is fundamentally what a blockchain is. It's got nothing to do with finance, with money. It's not, that's, this is what it is. It's just a data structure that provides an append-only uh, capability. Now, the way we make that possible is, as I said, by replication and via incentives. And so the incentives that Bitcoin invented is this, what's called the Bitcoin um, coin. The, you know, it's a fixed supply asset and that could be used for digital payments. And actually, um, primarily it's now being used as, as a replacement for gold, right? If you have um, uh, some assets, so if you have some money that you wanna, you have some value that you wanna keep around, in the old days you would buy gold and keep the gold around. These days you can buy um, one, of these, one of these digital assets and, uh, and try to uh, store your assets as, as such. Yeah, so this is kind of really a complement or just a replacement for gold. That's all it does. Now the, the next, big in, big, next big innovation is in the step is uh, the Ethereum network. This came out six years later and people realized, oh wait a minute, if I have this data structure that's an append only data structure, I can actually build a computer that runs on top of it. Yeah, I can write the computer. So I can write a program to this data structure. Yes, yeah, so another program code will live there forever and will never be removed. But code really kind of just maintains some state. And every time it takes an instruction from the outside world, the state can change it a little bit and according to the rules of, of the program and the new state will also be written to the blockchain. Yeah, so we, we basically, I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a bit more detail in a second, but basically we get this fully programmable environment where the programs themselves run on this data structure um, as is. And by the way, there's also this composability property where one program running on the chain can call another program running on the chain and that was actually quite a powerful, uh, pro quite a powerful mechanism. And this basically led to the growth of uh, what's called decentralized finance and NFTs and so on and so forth. Now, so what is this? So now that we understand kind of what this is, yeah, this is an append only data structure that allows you to run programs on top of this data structure. That's really what a blockchain is, technically what it is. Um, it's, I have to say, it's very sad to me that when you read about this in the press, that's not, nobody, nobody describes it like that, but that's fundamentally uh, what it is. So the question then is, what is this good for? And as we said, kind of the big, the big application is a digital currency. It's what's called a digital currency for stored value. As I said, a replacement for gold. And it turns out you should ask yourself, well, why do we need a replacement for gold? We already have gold, right? Well, gold is kind of a pain to mess with, right? You gotta, it's difficult to store, you have maybe, um, you know, it's heavy to carry around. 
where this stuff is actually a lot easier, uh, easier to move around. Why would we need it? Well, it turns out, you know, maybe in the US, we're perfectly happy with our financial system. But there are lots of countries around the world where the financial system doesn't work so well. So, you know, maybe in Argentina, people want to use these sort of things. There's a, there's a really interesting article that came out um, a few years ago. This is an economist who lives in Venezuela. And he wrote this article in the New York Times. It's really, if you guys have a minute, it's really worth reading this article. Um, basically about how uh, in Venezuela, where the local currency sort of collapsed, literally Bitcoin enabled him to save his family and continue operating. And um, I mean, he has a lot of use cases where he explains how this literally has um, allowed him to live his life. So we're, not everybody lives in the US where, the, where we have a stable, semi-stable financial system. Some people actually do, have, uh, do need help uh, with these kind of systems. So that's kind of the basic application. But then it turns out uh, once we start running, running programs on these blockchains, it turns out there are lots of other things we can do. There's something called de decentralized finance, which is basically new financial instruments that are managed by these programs. Um, so it's really quite interesting. These programs, literally, uh, they're relatively short programs, maybe 600, maybe 1,000 lines of code, relatively short programs that do lending. They allow people to exchange one coin for another. And, um, you know, they basically, they, they're written in this language called Solidity. Solidity, they run on the blockchain, and um, they manage, at this point, they manage billions of dollars. It's really quite remarkable that these relatively simple programs, anybody can inspect how the programs work. There are no secrets here, no dark rooms, um, no, uh, no back dealings. It's basically these 600-line programs that anyone can see. Anyone can see exactly how they work, and they manage uh, quite a lot of assets. Uh, let's see, there's assets management. There's another, oh, do I have a pointer here? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so uh, managing digital assets is another example uh, where these things are very useful. Maybe you've heard of, of these NFTs. And finally, I'll mention that there are also these blockchains are also useful um, for managing what are called decentralized organizations. This is basically where a bunch of people come together and they want to manage uh, assets, assets jointly. Yeah, so they want to vote on how to, do, uh, how to uh, manage their joint assets. Um, the the, this, this, the uh, closest physical world analogy to this is basically a partnership, but this is something that allows you to form partnerships uh, global that are very easy to create, and anyone in the world can participate in them. And finally, I'll say, you know, as a computer scientist, it's kind of interesting to, to program these things. These programs, they're written in this language called Solidity. It's kind of an unusual uh, way to program, and so it's also very interesting to just learn how to program these things. Okay, so um, let's see, I don't have a clock, so how am, I, how am I doing on time? How much time do I have left? 10, 10 minutes? 10 minutes, uh, five minutes. 15 minutes, okay, great, 15 minutes is good. So um, let's see, so uh, in that case I could go through this. So I wanted to show you how data actually, actually, you know what, no, I think I'm gonna skip this because I wanna leave time for, for questions, so I'm gonna skip this, uh, right. Uh, right, so somebody might, I wanted to show you how these things actually work, but I want to leave time for, qu for questions, so I'll, uh, I'll skip. If, if people are interested, I'll come, I'll come back to it later. Um, so let's see, so this, people always ask, like, why do we need to decentralize? Like, why can't we assume we have a single source, a single point that everybody trusts, like Google or the government? What's the problem uh, with running these things? Why can't we, uh, why do we need uh, to distribute trust? And so... They're very, you know, so like on the left, we have sort of the traditional systems, like, you know, we all trust a centralized bank. We all trust a centralized network, right? You, you guys are on, um, you use these social networks, they're very centralized, they have all your data, and uh, things seem to be working sort of okay. Why do we need to, to build things in a blockchain on the right? And so let's look at a few examples. Um, so one thing, you know, if you're trying to deploy a financial instrument that competes, so you try, let's say, you try to deploy something on the Bank of America network. Yeah, a new product on the Bank of an America network. And suppose what you're trying to deploy actually competes with one of the existing Bank of America services. There, you know, good luck to you trying to deploy this, right? If you compete with one of their own services, they're, they're, it's gonna be very difficult for you to actually deploy uh, your, your uh, service on their network. So that's kind of, uh, in a centralized world, people can refuse to allow you to deploy new, uh, new services Whereas on a blockchain, anyone can deploy anything. Yeah, anyone can write, um, you know, can write uh, a new, uh, they're called contracts, but anyone can write sort of a new program, deploy it to the chain, and the world can start actually using it. So there's nothing, nobody can prevent you from deploying uh, new applications. So this is a really big difference between the decentralized and the centralized world. Um, 
in the in the world of social networks, you know, from from time to time, social networks kind of change their end user agreements, and sometimes people get really upset, right? And then they they, they there's a movement to uh, to delete your data on this and that social network. You know, this movement maybe lasts for a week or two, then people realize they don't have a choice because all of their friends and all of their all of their data lives with this one company, and so they have to come back to the social network. And you know, even though the social network did something they're unhappy with, they're stuck with their service provider because that's where all the data lives and that's where all their friends are. Uh, in the blockchain space, basically, if you have uh, marketplaces that uh, people uh, uh, trade with with one another, if somehow the marketplace, one marketplace, changes the rules and they mess up with and they mess you up and you're kind of unhappy with the service they provide, they don't have any of your data. All your data is recorded on a blockchain. It's not, they don't have anything that you, you can't get yourself, so you would just move to a different marketplace and you're back on the horse. Yeah, so in some sense, you have a lot more freedom uh, in this environment than in the, uh, in the existing environment. Yeah, so again, there are lots of caveats to this. Uh, there are lots, lots of ways, um, it's actually, it would be interesting uh, um, to, ha to have a, a point and counterpoint in this discussion. But for now, I'll, I think I'll just leave it at that. And finally, I'll say that many of the centralized services typically are regional, right? So that you would you you have banks operating in the U.S., you have partnerships in the U.S., whereas in the in the blockchain world, anyone with an internet connection can interact with these systems. It doesn't matter really where you are in the world. So basically, we have much greater accessibility to a financial system where someone living in a poor country somewhere. Uh, in the world, maybe they have no access to the existing financial system, but if they have an internet connection, they can actually participate in any of these uh, DeFi uh, environments. Yeah, so those are kind of uh, some of the differences. It's, by the way, amazing, amazing to me, um, uh, you know, periodically I run into people from places that, like, you know, literally poor villages in the middle of nowhere somewhere in Asia, that um, started, that discovered the, this environment, the blockchain environment. They started uh, contributing and interacting with these systems. Uh, that as a result, they got pulled out of their villages and, and then they come to our conferences and we run into them all the time. So it's really quite, quite amazing to see this. This is not a, a theory. Like, um, it's quite amazing to see people who literally came out of nowhere uh, and they were able to basically pull themselves out of those out of those places simply because they had an internet connection and were able to contribute to the environment to, the, to this to this uh, ecosystem. And as a result, uh, they 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 got pulled out and kind of joined, um, well, I'd say kind of the, the the modern world. All right. So yeah. So this is again kind of an area that brings together. Um, it's very broad. Brings together computer science, economics, political science. Political science, by the way, is needed for governance. Yeah. So there's a, a bunch of people who uh, want to make decisions together. And uh, there's this question of how do we run an election system? How do we govern a complicated system as a group? And that actually is something that falls exactly in the realm of political science. So there are lots of political science experiments happening in the blockchain space um, as to you know, how do we run an election? How do we get people to participate? How do we get people to vote in the way that's best for the system rather than uh, maybe uh, uh, specifically best for themselves? Um, so there's a lot of a lot of experiments happening in, happening in this area, uh, and uh, um, you know it's, it's it's quite interesting. Eventually, I think that maybe the, even the um, the way the way uh, real world systems actually govern themselves might actually learn from how uh, from how these uh, DAOs actually govern. Okay, so there are lots of experiments in the space. I wanted to mention two in particular. So DAI is an interesting DAI is an interesting project in this space. DAI is basically something that provides a currency that's, um, that's uh, stable. Yeah, so it it's, uh, basically tries to be as close as possible to the value of the US dollar. So one die is supposed to be worth one dollar. Yeah, the question is how do, you, how do you build a system like this when your underlying assets, things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on, the underlying ath assets fluctuate a lot in value. So how do you build a stable currency on top of an unstable asset? And again, there's beautiful economic theory for making that work. And so if you're interested, you can go look at how this uh, MakerDAO project uh, works, uh, which is, again, kind of an idea for building a stable currency out of unstable assets. I won't, I won't have time to explain how this works, how, how this works here. But uh, just if you're interested, there's actually really interesting ideas, quite pretty ideas for making this work. The other project I wanted to highlight is called Uniswap, which is an exchange. So imagine. Imagine you have one type of currency, maybe you have DAI, and you want to exchange that DAI for another type of currency, currency, let's say Ether, ETH, yeah? 
So if you want to exchange one for the other, how do you do it? In a particular, how do you decide what the exchange rate should be? So in fact, I want to show you a little bit about how Uniswap works because this is kind of, this is kind of cute. So there's like interesting math uh, that, comes, that comes up here. So I'm going to show you a very, very simplified version of uh, Uniswap just to give you one idea, one technical idea that's come up in the space. I kind of like this idea because it's, it's, very, it's very pretty mathematically. So again, suppose we have ETH, that's like the currency of Ethereum. I have ETH and you have DAI. And uh, we want to exchange ETH for DAI. So the question is, how do we do it? So you can imagine all sorts of ways in which we can build an exchange. Maybe what we do is we do what's called an order book, where I post the fact that I want to exchange, I want to exchange, I, want, I have 10 ETH that I want to exchange for DAI. Maybe you post the fact that you have DAI and you want to exchange your DAI for ETH. And then the order book will kind of reconcile our two orders. Yeah, this is what's called um, an order, order book approach. It turns out that's kind of a difficult way to, uh, to, build, uh, to build these exchanges. Another, just, oh, by the way, another way to do it, of course, is to have a centralized exchange, right? You can imagine a company, a bank, that would say, sure, give me your DAI, give me your ETH, and I'll do the exchange for you, right? So that's typically how, how these exchanges work. But it turns out there's a, there's a very interesting idea. It's called an automatic market maker. That I, I want to show you how it works. I think you'll understand. Yeah, and, and you'll see exactly how uh, these exchanges and the exchange rates are decided in these automated market makers. Okay, so, so here's how this works. So Uniswap, all it is, it's a program. It's a program that runs on this blockchain. Literally, you can look at the source code. It's all open source. It's about a thousand lines of code, not even a very big program. And what it does is it basically allows people to uh, submit their assets into this program. Okay, so these are called liquidity providers, where basically, you know, people who own ETH, people who own DAI, they go ahead and just give their assets to this program. So, and the program basically is the one that's managing their assets for them. So you should ask, well, why would a sane person give their assets to a program that doesn't make any sense? And the answer is, well, the reason people do it is because uh, this program will pay them interest, okay? So you can withdraw your assets from the program at any given time, and not only would you, will you withdraw your assets, you'll, you'll withdraw your assets with interest. Yeah, so you should be asking, well, how is the program getting, getting additional assets to pay me interest? And we'll see how that happens in just a minute. By the way, you can actually inspect the code of the program. Yeah, so there's no magic here. The program says, yes, if you, if you uh, give me X ETH, you can withdraw your ETH at any given time, and you'll get additional interest on top of the, of the initial deposit. Okay? So this is all encoded in the, in the rules of the program, so you're guaranteed that this is actually how it's, gonna, how it's going to work. You don't have to trust anyone to do it. The program, you know, sometimes people say code is law. The program actually says how this thing will work, and so you're guaranteed to get your deposit back. Okay. Um, right. So, so that's, um, at least, you, uh, again, you, you can verify that the program does what it's supposed to do, so uh, you, you, uh, you will get your deposit back. So those are the liquidity providers. Yeah, so this program now manages a whole bunch of ETH and manages a whole bunch of DAI. So now a user, oh yeah, so here, so we can, we can think of it as managing X ETH and Y DAI, so we can put it on a graph. And you can see that, let's see, the X coordinate is how much ETH is in the, in the program, and the Y coordinate is how much DAI is in the program. And right now, we're at a particular point, X comma Y. So far, so good? So like the, the state of the program is represented as one point on that graph. Very good. So now, um, the wonderful idea behind Uniswap is what's called the constant product formula. Okay, what the program is going to do is it's going to maintain the fact that x times y should be constant. x times y should be, like, let's say, uh, 100. So if you think back to your, uh, to your um, uh, algebra days, or maybe your current algebra days, if you look at the graph x times y equals 100, that graph has a name. Right? That's called a, that's what? That's called a hyperbola, right? So you can see what I drew here is a picture of a hyperbola, which captures, you know, so y equals 100 over x. That's a hyperbola that, uh, cap that's uh, exactly what's, what's drawn here. Now, suppose a user comes along and says, hey, I want to sell 12 ETH, and I want to exchange 12 ETH for DAI. Yeah, so I want to give you 12 ETH, you give me DAI. The question is, how much DAI should, uh, the, uh, should Uniswap give back? Yeah, so what is the, what is the exchange rate? And so the exchange rate is going to be determined by the constant product formula. Yeah, and that's actually... Uh, what the cute idea is. So let me explain to you how this works, and then I'll explain why this, pro this, uh, this, this uh, formula is the one that makes it work. So here's what happens. So if, if, if Alice here 
gives, gives the contract 12 ETH, then now the contract is going to have X plus 12 ETH, right? Everybody agrees it has more ETH than it did before because it just received 12 additional ETH. But that means it's now it's off the hyperbola, right? It's off of the graph that it's supposed to be on. So what does it do? It's supposed to give die back exactly the right amount of die back so that it gets back onto uh, the curve. So if it gives die back, it means it has less die, so it's going to go down. Yeah, so we're going to go down. And it turns out if you send back 9.6 die, you end up back on the curve x times y equals Is there a question? Five minutes, yeah. So if you, if you give back 9.6 die, then you end up on this curve x times y equals 100. And so that's how this program decides what the exchange rate is, right? So uh, we end up on this new point, x plus 12 comma y minus 9.6. And the program basically sends back 9.6 die to Alice. Is that clear? So that's how the program decides what the exchange rate is. So far so good? So you want to sell it 12 die, 12 ETH, it'll give you 9.6 die back, and now the, 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 the state moves to this other point on the curve. So you should be asking, well, why is this the right thing to do? Who came up with this? Why, this seems like a pretty weird idea, right? Who, who came up with this uh, idea? Well, it turns out you can actually prove a theorem. It's a really beautiful theorem that, that says that if you, uh, if you in fact, um, actually, maybe I should back up just a second. Um, right, maybe I should back up just one second. And so what happened here is, again, we exchanged 12 ETH for 9.6 die. If it turns out there is some other exchange out there in the world that will give you a better exchange rate, then that creates what are called arbitrage opportunities. 